wrestling through this text uh, because I'm going to, over the next month, I'll be talking about creativity, talk about dreaming, talk about uh, your imagination. And I couldn't understand why God would have us to cast down our imagination. Uh, but I needed another translation to help me understand it. I want you to keep, stay right there, 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. I now want you to read it from the NIV, 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 uh, from the NIV. Everybody declare it aloud. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Uh, so what the King James Version lost out was, I bring down everything in my imagination that's trying to make me think that what God is calling me to do will not work. Y'all not saying anything. Everything that is trying to speak to me against my dream, against my idea, against my vision, against my creativity, I cast it down. When I try to tell myself I'm too old, it's too late, it is not going to happen, nobody believes in me, I don't have a support system, a recession is about to hit, I cast down every imagination because if God be for me who can be against me I can't hear any worshiper everything in the universe that's trying to tell you you will not be a success is a lie everything that's trying to convince you that you will always struggle is a lie everything that's telling you you will always work for somebody else is a lie everything in your imagination that does not match with the will of God I bind it with the blood of Jesus and those of you that know the last two months of the year God is gonna bless everything you dream about everything you prayed about everything you've been holding on to you're blessed in the city you're blessed in the field you're blessed and you're coming out. You're blessed and you're going in. You're blessed where you sit down. You're blessed where you go to sleep. Cast off every imagination. Your imagination will get the best of you when you're trying to do something for God. Be seated. I got to show you this. You only argue with God the most when it's time for you to give to him. You begin to argue, can I afford to do this? Is this what God really requires? All of that is, in fact, an attempt to mess with your conviction. The voice that you hear the most is the voice in your head. And so you got to start talking to yourself that the word is true. He gives seed to the sower. If you cast your bread upon the waters after not too many days, it is coming back to you. Give and it will be given back to you. Press down, shaken together and running over. For the last 10 months, has God been Jehovah Jireh to anybody? I want us to give with great expectation. On our screen, you'll see how it is that you'll give the platforms for our giving. I don't want you to talk yourself out of your blessing. I need you to get out of your own way. I need you to expect that God has great expectation for your future, for your destiny, for your assignment, or for your next level. I, uh, I, I need you to know that you should never have to talk yourself into giving at new birth uh, because we're good stewards over what it is that God has blessed us with. There is no church, no church on the planet that can boast in God of feeding one million people in the pandemic. This is good ground to sow in. Can you imagine not even a month after reaching uh, that uh, demarcation, meeting, meeting and exceeding that goal? Uh, that on the 17th, we're going to be giving families in this community 3,000 families turkeys for them to take home. Three, y'all ain't shouting about that? 3,000. 
2,000 families. Can you imagine that just last week, 2,000 young people from this county came onto our campus and walked away with some $20 million worth of college scholarships. That's the kind of God that we serve, and that's the kind of environment that you are in. Our servant leaders are moving amongst you. If you're absent of an envelope, I need you to give. Those of you who are online, I want to challenge you to give even in this moment. I want to stretch your faith on today. I don't know why, but there are those of you who are in this room that can hear my voice, how that God is up pushing you to go into bounds that you have never trafficked in before. Those of you who are online, I want you over and beyond your tithing. I want uh, just 30 of you to give a seed of 300 on this day. I'm uh, saying, God, I trust you. I don't know what you're going to do, but I know that you're in charge. I don't know how you're going to handle it, but I know that you are capable. I don't know where it is that you are, but I want you to sow that seed of 300 uh, on this day, saying, God, I see what you're doing. I feel what is happening at New Birth, and I want to be a part of the ecosystem that is making a difference and making an impact. We are a tithing church, and because we're a tithing church, we give what percent of our income to God? Come on, talk back to your pastor. What percent do you give to God? Amen, because God is the giver of every good and every perfect gift. I need every single one of you to get that uh, seed in your possession. Uh, once you have it, would you lift up that envelope if you're giving electronically? Lift up that phone, please. Lift up that phone. If you're giving, I shouldn't see your screensaver. <laughs> you playing yourself. Come on now. Can a man, can a woman rob God? Yes, electronically. Come on, lift up. Amen. It's the first Sunday of the month, and as a consequence, I am believing that what you do on this day is going to set the pace, it's going to set the tempo, it's going to uh, set uh, the barometer of what you are going to expect for the rest of this month. With everything that's taking place with uh, Wall Street, everything that's happening in the economy, uh, you've got to know that you have another source, uh, that I'll look to the hills from whence cometh my help, uh, my help cometh from God. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things shall be added. God ought to be your first priority, it's your first bill. You pay him before you pay your car note, before you pay your rent, before you pay your mortgage, before you pay aftercare, uh, before it is that you pay insurance. You've got to make God a priority uh, because you've always been his. Every person who has that seed lifted up, lifted up high, I'm not given to be seen, but I don't mind being seen given because folk done seen me do some other stuff. Amen. Let the rumor go out that I am a cheerful giver. Repeat after me, Lord, thank you for what you did last year. Thank you for what you did last month. Thank you for what you did last week. Thank you for what you did yesterday. But the seed in my hand is an expectation for what you're going to do before this month is over. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless the Lord. Our servant leaders, they are moving amongst you zealously. Uh, those of you who want to sow for yourself, uh, then you are able uh, to do that. Uh, yesterday, I had the wonderful delight uh, to have breakfast with 300 of our entrepreneurs who are members of our church. Uh, let me ask all the entrepreneurs to make some noise. All the entrepreneurs uh, make some noise. I'm grateful uh, for all of them. I'm believing that God is going to make them captains of industry, uh, that they are anointed for the workplace, uh, that God is going to uh, make sure that their cup runs over. I want you to have that kind of faith, that kind of expectation uh, that God can do anything but fail. I need you coming. I need you coming. Every person. Those of you who are online, you would sit up in that bed. Amen. You, you had an extra hour to sleep. The least you can do is sit up and watch church. Amen. Bless the Lord. How many of y'all needed that extra hour this morning? You needed uh, that extra hour for it. I'm grateful uh, unto God uh, for it. 
Amen. On uh, Tuesday nights is uh, our group therapy. Uh, I'm going to be talking about creative theology, why it is the intention of God uh, that all of us are called to be creative. Uh, would you look at the person beside you and tell them there's something creative in you. There's something uh, creative in you. And I'm believing that in the month of November, uh, it is going to be exposed, it's going to be revealed, and it is going to be unpacked. Those of you who have a birthday in the month of November, would you stand? You got a birthday? Amen. With Jonathan Nelson. Amen. Amen. Would you remain standing for just one moment? I speak over your life for every person who's standing that the rest of your life is going to be the best of your life. You have already outlived your worst season, but greater is getting ready to come. New birth because we are loving church. Bless the Lord. Uh, allow me to uh, introduce uh, to you our uh, next Secretary of State, uh, B. Wynn. Would you raise your hand? We're so honored to have you. Come on, clap your hands for her. And I need you to really make some noise for New Birth's own Alicia Washington. She's running for Council Member 5 here in Stonecrest. We've got your back, and we're praying uh, for you. If you have your Bibles, would you join me in Mark chapter 2? Mark chapter 2. I ask that you'll stand to your feet. Those of you who are physically able, I ask that you'll do that. Mark chapter 2, verse number 4. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and lowered the mat that the man was lying on. You may be seated. I want to preach for a little while uh, today using as a subject, there's got to be another way. There's, would you look at the person beside you and tell them there's got to be another way? Look at the person on the other side and say, you ain't going to give up sitting next to me. Look him and I tell him, you best believe there's got to be another way. There's got to be another way. Comrades, in the heartbeat of the 20th century, Psychologist Carl Dunker coined a cognitive performance test known as the candle problem. In it, the participants were given a candle, a book of matches, and a box of drawing pens. They were issued the task of finding a way of attaching the candle to the wall and lighting it without wax dripping to the floor. Most people fail the exercise because they try to pin the candle to the wall or use melted wax as an adhesive. You should know that neither is effective. The solution is to empty the box of drawing pins and use the pins to attach the box to the wall. As a consequence, the box becomes a shelf. The candle sits on the shelf, and from there it can be lit. Most adults have a problem with this exercise because they only see the box as a box and not as a shelf. This illumines how set we become in our thinking and how difficult it is to disrupt adopted acceptability. In between our ears is the most complex biological instrument on the planet, 
with almost as many neurons as there are stars in the Milky Way. Your brain wants to birth boundless creativity, but something in your mind keeps making it become aborted. The daily routine will become hardwired so that neurologically we go into autopilot. The route we drive to work, the way we make coffee, the side of the bed we sleep on, how we make love, how we worship, has become so programmed in our subconscious that we only allow ourselves to do it one way. No conscious thought is required. And any shift or variant from that is considered an irritant. So you have to mentally adjust to doing a new thing. And how much harder must it be to make the adjustment to becoming a new human being? The weight of all of that is called creativity. At school, we learn facts and formulas. We taught that there is a right way of doing things and a wrong way, even if we both arrive at the same answer. Following established patterns is encouraged over experimentation. So on your job, they want you to do it only by the manual even if you have a more efficient and an effective way to do it, they are in fact myopic in thought and believe you can only do it one way. I want you to write this down. Those of you who are online, I need you to put this in the thread for me. Habit is the enemy of faith. Did you hear what I just said? Habit is the enemy of of faith. I want every person in the room, would you declare that out loud? Habit is the enemy of faith. Miracles don't know rules. Miracles do not know rules. The Red Sea is 31 miles in length. It is 1,610 feet in depth. To go across it, you either have to swim it or you have to sail it. But for the children of Israel, there had to be another way. So God told Moses, lift up your rod and walk through it. I need every person in this room, would you just lift up that hand? There are some things that, that society thought you were going to have to swim through. But I declare over every lifted hand that God right now is preparing a different way for you to get through it. How other people had to deal with their problem, how they had to deal with their solution, how they had to deal with their bills, how they had to deal with their stress. That is not what God is setting up for you. He said, when you lift up your hands, I'm going to start separating things on your behalf. So now all you're going to have to do is just walk through it. As a creative, you have to adopt to oppositional thinking. You have to adopt to oppositional thinking. Fashion designer Alexander McQueen co-opted a quote from the Dalai Lama that says, learn the rules well so you know how to break them properly. Learn the rules well so you know how to break them properly properly. Rap music has bars. Novels has uh, grammatical precepts. Music has established chords. But you are anointed for oppositional thinking. Oppositional thinking requires that you are able to identify the conventions and then go in the opposite direction. 
give a car battery a jump. You've got to get cables, but when you get cables, you've got to know how to plug the negative up to the positive. If there are two positives, it will never start. The positive has got to be connected to the negative. Why? Because opposites attract. I want to speak something over your life. All the negativity in your past is about to draw positivity into your future. Many of you are not going to get the jump you need because you haven't had any negative experiences in your life. But when you have had negative trauma, but you connect it to positive faith, you know that God is getting ready to put you on a path and on a trail that nobody can stop. This is a good place for me to tell you. All things work together for good to those that love him and are called according according to his purpose. Our forever first lady, Michelle Obama, said, when they go low, we go high. Why? Because she understood the power of opposite thinking. Whenever you go in the opposite direction, expect opposition. Whenever you go in the opposite direction, expect opposition. It is a part of your creative tension. The police in Birmingham unleashed fire hoses and barking dogs. So King went in the opposite direction and chose nonviolence. When we were getting bludgeoned coming across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, Malcolm X went in the opposite direction and said, by any means necessary. Cars for 100 years were running on gas. Uh, and so Elon Musk went in the opposite direction and made them electric. When the present governor, who was former secretary of state, was responsible for purging a half million people off of the voter rolls because Stacey Abrams was registering people who had never voted before, even after he purged a half million people, people off of the rolls, he still only won by 50,000 votes. He thought Stacy was going to go away quietly, but she understood oppositional thinking. Y'all not saying nothing to me for the last four years. She was not an election denier. She knew she was dealing with a thief and said, I'm going to run it anyway, but I run the right way in order to get it done. Y'all ain't saying nothing in me in here. When Jeb Bush stole the election for his brother so that he could become president of these yet to be United States of America, we didn't even deny the election. We said we'll go another way since y'all stole that one. We'll elect Barack Obama, but we won't do it once. We'll do it twice because we understood the power of oppositional thinking. So Governor Kemp, he decided that he was going to take measures in his own hands because so many black and brown people were registered to vote. And I need you to be clear that these laws that were put in place was not because of voter fraud. They were put in place because of voter turnout. And so they made it illegal. They made it illegal for you to give out water. They made it illegal for us to provide transportation for those who were disabled. They made it an option of whether or not there would be go to the polls Sunday. And in spite of all of that, can you look at what you did in the last two weeks? Two million people have turned out to vote because we understood the authority of opposition thinking. 30% of the 2 million are black and brown people and if we make that 38%, everybody who we praying for is about to get elected. What the enemy doesn't know is black people never back down from a fight. If you show us the rules and you put us in the ring, we always gonna win. You can try to make us sit in the bus, back of the bus, 
You can try to make us not drink from the water fountain. You can try to make us not eat from the lunch counter. But the original gangster rap music was before I be a slave. I'll be buried in my grave and go on to my Lord and be free. Why? Because it's oppositional thinking. So on Tuesday, we've got to make sure that we shake every bush, climb every tree, go into every barbershop, invade every college campus, and let the community know it is your turn to make a difference. It is your time to do what is needed and necessary. The previous generation went to jail. The least you can do is just get in line. I don't care if it's raining, snowing, or sleeting, but my grandmother and your grandmother went through too much for lazy Negroes to say it's an inconvenience and it ain't gonna change nothing. Who do you think you are? You are the beneficiaries of those that died for us to have the privilege. You've got to think differently because God is getting ready to provide a different way. I want you to be seated. I want you to take instance of what took place in Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus has come to Capernaum and the crowd is almost combustible. They're combustible with enthusiasm because of excitement and because they are welcoming home their hometown hero. The numbers are maddening. Uh, but what I need you to see what Mark did not put in the text is that they've got to have church at the house because the church was not receptive to somebody who was creative. I better say that again. Jesus was not welcome to preach at the church uh, because he did things in an unconventional manner. So Jesus said, I ain't got to have church at church. I can have church at home. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I need those of y'all who in the middle of COVID-19, you learn how to have church at home. That even if you couldn't get in here, you learn how to give God glory right in your own house. I need those of y'all who had some of your best worship at home. Would you give God glory? Not like you're at church. Would you worship God the way you did in the pandemic and bless the Lord right there at home? The church would not let Jesus in, so he had worship at home. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but I believe I'm assigned to somebody who's in this room who needs to know this morning that even if they won't let you in the company, build a conglomerate from your couch. Develop an LLC from your living room. Sell stocks from the kitchen. Develop a drop ship business from the dining room. Bake up a billion dollar idea while you were sitting in the bed. There are those of you who I'm talking to, God says, watch me bless you so that you ain't ever got to go walk and work a regular conventional job another day in your life. But I need 500 of y'all who believe that I am going to make money from home, that God is getting ready to change the paradigm of what it is that I am doing. I get dressed when I feel like it. I get in the car when I need to go to the store. But God is getting ready to bless me at home. As for me and my house, we gonna serve the Lord. Here's your shout and make money. I believe somebody in this room, would you just shout your address right here? I said, shout your address right there. Y'all ain't waiting. I said, Shout your address right there. Checks are coming to your house. Contracts are coming to your house. Business opportunities are coming to your house. Jesus said, they won't let me at the church. Let me do it from home. The house is filled to capacity to the point of breaking the fire code. 
and four men carrying their friend who is paralyzed. They trying to get to the house where Jesus is. They knew that doctors don't give medicine for healing, but just for stabilization. They didn't want their friend to be just maintained. They wanted their friend to be whole. Uh, in another way, this man, here it is, it says that he is paralyzed. Paralyzed, you already know, means he cannot move. For whoever has lost the ability to make a move, God brought you into this worship encounter so that you can get the push that you need. I don't know where you are, but you are no longer going to feel stuck and stagnant in your life. Those who are paralyzed are not always in wheelchairs. They're not always bound to a bed. But I'm talking to your child who will not leave the room. I'm talking to your husband who has lost his passion. I'm talking to your wife who is at her wit's end. I am talking to the man who has sunken into depression. I'm talking to the girl who has lost her grit. God told me to tell you, you ain't going to stay stuck another day in your life. You are surrounded by people who want to see you make the greatest move of your life. Look at your neighbor and say, you ain't going to sit next to me and be stuck. You ain't going to be stuck in that dead end job. You ain't going to be stuck in that dead end relationship. You ain't going to be stuck in that one way friendship. I will carry you if I got to. But you ain't going to end this year in the same position. The enemy don't know. He should have never let them sit next to you. But if you want to see the people around you step into the the greatest season of their life would you shout for them for them to get that push would you yell for them for them to get that push would you holler for them so that they can get that push hallelujah be seated please hallelujah now you ain't gonna be stuck Hallelujah. I dare you. Come on. Come on. I dare you. Just push them a little bit. Do you know what you getting ready to walk into? Push them a little bit. Do you know the ancestors are depending on you? Pushing them a little bit. Do you know your children are looking up to you? Push them a little bit. Do you know society didn't believe in you? Pushing them. This is the push that you needed. And here they are, trying to get their friend to Jesus. It was nothing wrong with them. It was something wrong with somebody who they cared about. Some of y'all are never going to be blessed because when you go to God, it's only about you. But I need those of y'all in this room that there's somebody in your family, somebody in your life, somebody in your circle. Can I say it this way? Somebody on your row that you want more for them than where they are right now. Would you do me a favor? Would you give God glory for whoever in your life needs a push that's going to change their life? All they trying to do is get their paralyzed friend to Jesus. They're trying to get their paralyzed friend to Jesus and they can't get in the church. They can't get in the house. But I want to submit to you humbly today that these four friends must have been creators because they thought to themselves, there's got to be another way. First black woman to ever run for president, Shirley Chisholm said, when there's no seat at the table, bring a folding chair. You, you, you got to find another way. They said, if they won't let us in the door, let's take him up to the roof. Some of y'all don't know that your enemies are making you elevate. 
they tried to make you go down, but they didn't understand. God said, I'll make your enemies your footstools. If you want to go high, get haters. You ain't popping unless they talking about you. You ain't popping until they scandalize your name. You ain't popping until they try to block you and you ain't done nothing to her. He said, I'm going to use your haters as your elevators. Says, I got to take them to a higher level. Most people, most people when they're talking about breakthrough, they usually talk about breakthrough, hear this in alignment of getting out of something getting out of something. But these four friends who are trying to get their friend to Jesus, they're not trying to get out. They're trying to break in. I better say something. I don't know where my praises are today, but God says if I can get some worshipers, your child is going to break into that school. I don't know where you are. If I could get some screamers, you are about to break into that field. God says, I don't care what they tried to block you out of. There is nothing you can do to stop a worshiper. He said, if you open up your mouth, you going to get into that house you ain't qualified for. You going to get into that car. You don't have the credit that matches it. I don't need to get out of nothing. I need Need to step into something and God I need you to help me step into it they go up to the roof and when they go up to the roof they do something significant they uh they tear the roof up uh. they tear the roof up because they're trying to get him to Jesus. And uh, as they're lowering him down, Jesus sees their faith. I got to get out of here. I need to worship. The enemy wasn't prepared for this. I, I need to worship. Watch this on behalf of the people. Here's your shout that let you down. I be, be, because they got no idea that when they let you down, they were getting God's attention. They had no idea when they didn't keep their word, when they broke their promise. That's when God recognized. Says, um, they broke open the roof and they lowered them down. And when they lowered them down, the Bible says something I need you to pay attention to. And Jesus saw their faith. Hallelujah. And Jesus saw their faith. He never saw the faith of the one that was sick. He saw, hear this, the faith of the creatives. that you thought outside of the box and said, I'm going to go another way because they wouldn't let me in the front door. I got to get out of here, but this is for those of y'all that got a crazy idea. Those of y'all that color outside of the line. Those of you who dream the impossible dream. God said, because you came to church today, I see your faith and everything you've been trying to do is about to take off. I don't need you to shout for what you have. I want you to shout for what you been dreaming for what you've been thinking for what you've been believing that God is getting ready to do it he says I see your faith I see what you're trying to do I so see what you're after and I need you to notice something that uh, that Jesus never prays for him That Jesus never calls for a vial of oil. That Jesus never lays hands. Hallelujah. I want you, um, 
I want you right where you are. If you'll indulge me, my time is almost up. I need your hand in the hand of somebody real quick. I'm not finished. I'm just almost through. I got to show you something, please. Hallelujah. He says, you are creative. You thought outside of the box they wouldn't let you in. They wouldn't give you access. They wouldn't give you opportunity. They tried to block you at every turn. Let me show you what I'm getting better to do. No matter what happens in the next 90 seconds, don't let that neighbor's hand go. He said, because you are such a creative thinker, because you dare to dream, because you trust me to believe, because you don't mind being ostracized, what I'm going to do for you, I hope that y'all will tear this church up. He says, I'm getting ready to heal whoever you've been worried about. God, I can't hear nobody in here. He says, I'm getting ready to heal whoever's been on your heart. I, I'm getting ready to take care of whoever can't stand on their own. No. I, I know that um, you really thought this message was about your business. I know you thought it was about capitalistic pursuits and entrepreneurial enterprises. God said, I'm gonna get to that. But today I gotta heal somebody. Oh my God. I gotta heal somebody and here's the worship that's getting ready to engulf this room. I gotta heal somebody who couldn't get in the church. I don't know whether they're in the hospital. I don't know whether they're in hospice. I don't care if they're in a nursing facility. I don't know if they're bedridden. But God said, because of your faith, I'm getting ready to do something amazing in their life that no doctor could have ever performed. I've asked you to have somebody's hand in your hand, not in an exercise of futility, but because it required four friends. And I'm believing that it's getting ready to happen. Hallelujah. There's getting ready to be a worship in this room that is an exercise of your faith. That God, I need them to stand before this year is over. Hallelujah. If I leave it to conventional thinking, they're not going to make it. But God, I believe that you are a healer. That you can do anything but fail. If by the grace of God, you don't have anybody in your family, anybody in your life that's sick, you ought to be thankful in this moment. But I need you to join your faith to somebody else on your row that's got a mother that's ill, that's got a father whose cancer is irreversible, has got a sibling that uh, is taking a caseload of medication. God says, I'm going to watch your faith. And based off of what you do in these 60 seconds, I'm going to have your relatives stand back up again. God, I can't hear nobody. I, I, I wonder if y'all will shout about this. God said, your scream will cancel death certificates. Your, your, your holler will cancel funerals. I want to hear the sound of worshipers in this room that believe that God is absolutely able to do anything. Hallelujah. Lift up that hand, please. 